Hi, you're listening to I Have a Podcast. I'm Vinny Potestivo, and you're in for a treat because on today's episode, you are going to meet a very dear friend of mine. She's a philanthropist, a client, a CEO, and so much more, a true staple in New York City society, and she makes an impact like no other. I'm talking about Mrs. Audrey Groose. Now, not only are you about to hear an oral history of how one of the most impactful voices in depression research came to make a difference, and she did it by contributing to the advancement of depression research by creating Hope for Depression Research Foundation, which is a literal network of scientists working worldwide together in real time, discovering new ways to help the world treat, cope, and address depression in our own mental health and well-being. I also had the honor of helping Mrs. Groose relaunch Hope Fragrances, the only fragrance line I know of that donates all net profits to depression research. And in early 2020, we introduced two more uplifting fragrances, Hope Day and Hope Night, along with the launch of Hope Fragrances in Bergdorf Goodman in New York City or BergdorfGoodman.com for those who aren't here. Okay, now I promised this would be a great episode, and here's why. I want you to understand where Mrs. Groose began, to understand how she landed the amazing job and position to make an impact in depression and on our own mental health. And we start by understanding her childhood story as an immigrant from Lithuania during war, where she learned the value of education. And we understand the subjects that shaped her, such as science and the creative arts, and how those two disciplines help propel her to succeed in the corporate and competitive world of skincare. She also offers up some mental health awareness and tools to help us and others. And we talk about the discipline and work ethic needed to truly find yourself, who you are, what matters most, and how to make an impact in your own way, which she found a way to do successfully. So let's find out how. The key aspect of my, I don't want to say success, but the key aspect of how I function is the fact that I do have a creative part in me that I very much got from my mother, who was a writer, and from our family genes. One aunt was an opera singer, another was an artist. So I have those creative genes, but definitely through my training, through my discipline in college, which will, you know, I'll tell you biology and all the learning of biology, which is very structured yeah. and very precise. I learned to think a certain way. Sometimes my creativity just comes out in, for example, my entertaining or working on events where I think of creative ways to invite people to raise money. But I always do it within a very organized, structured ability. I see that as very interesting, creativity and what you do and during COVID and all of that. And then there's also the basic way that you operate. So it's form and function. I know you as the president of Hope Fragrances, president of the Audrey and Martin Roos Foundation, and of course, as the founding chairman of the Hope for Depression Research Foundation. So many foundations, so much impact, so much change in people's lives, not only just my own personal and professional one. So I have to stop and say thank you for letting me even touch this world of change. Because when I say I want to help people make impact, you make beautiful impact. But I know there's an art and a science to it. And it comes with training and experience. So I'm curious about the experiences that may have led up to it educationally or professionally. Can you walk me through how we got to where we are today? Or what helped inform the structure of how you've assembled your tools to be able to make impact? Boy, are you a wonderful questioner. That was so artistic, just inarticulate. Um, I actually am a combination of art and science. I think you just said it. And it really, you know, it starts with your genes. What were your parents? What was your family like? And my mother was a writer. My mother wrote every day of her life. She loved poetry. She loved iambic pentameter. And somebody, some of her poems are da 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 I mean, I actually, my sisters and I actually published a book of her poetry. She was a very brilliant and very special woman. And her two sisters were also creative. My one aunt was an opera singer and my other aunt was an artist. So there you go, three women in that family that all were very creative. Although my grandfather was a banker. I don't know where his creativity came, maybe, (laughs) whatever. And my dad was a cavalry officer in the Lithuanian army. 
in Europe, when my parents came here, they really struggled and went through the war. It was a traumatic, terrible time. And coming here to America was fortunate that we came here rather than Australia or Brazil or a very distant country. You know, it would be like if you and I had to change our life and go to China and learn to speak Chinese and yeah. take care of our children and work. How would we do that? When I think about it, I don't know how my parents did that, but the trauma of the war definitely affected my mother. She was a very creative woman, but also had depression. And I will get to that when we get to that in the timeline. But I found that uh, I was a very good student. My parents valued education so much because the loss of everything in their lives didn't mean that they lost their brain, their education, and how they functioned. And right. both of them worked and both of them supported their children, even though they took years, I think, to get through the trauma of losing their country, their homeland, their beautiful home and environment um, in the country of Lithuania, one of the small Baltic countries in Northern Europe. Anyway, I was very good in school. I got great grades and my best subjects were always English, even though English was my third language. I spoke Lithuanian, German, then um, English. And I went to Tufts University. I got a scholarship to go to Tufts and I wanted to be a doctor. I think I always had this feeling of helping other people. And to me, that was one of the best ways that I could help others. My mother always instilled that idea in me too, that a doctor was a very positive, important person that could help others in the best way. So I was pre-med at Tufts and I graduated with honors, but it's very funny that while I was there, my I had the top grade in the English placement exam of a thousand students when we entered in our freshman year. And then my best grades were always in the creative areas and humanities and social sciences. And at one point I tried out for a play, Strindberg's play, Miss Julie, and I got the play and the people there said to me, who are you? How did you get this? You're an actor. How did you know how to do this? Well, I used to recite my mother's poetry on Radio Free Europe because her original poetry was about missing her homeland, her country, and wanting to go back. I mean, they never thought they would stay in the States because the Russians took over Lithuania after the war during Yalta Baltics were just given to the Russians. So I recited my mother's poetry over Radio Free Europe and in other commemorations of Lithuania's independence before they were taken over. And I was kind of a natural actress. I couldn't do the play because they said, who are you? And I said, well, I'm a biology major. And my labs <laughs> prevented me from going to the rehearsals and all of that to play Miss Julie. But I think that always served me very well because even when I went into business and I learned how to make presentations to committees, my ability to speak in front of people, I think that my mother helped groom by doing these recitations and saying her poetry over those years. So after college, although I did graduate with a degree in science, I did not want to go to medical school. When I went to school in the 70s, it was too hard still for women. My grades were better, as I mentioned, in the creative areas rather than the sciences. Although I loved the structure of studying science. I loved the inductive and deductive reasoning. I loved structuring my information. And I still do that to this day. I look at things in a very organized, clear way. If disparate things or on a piece of paper or presented to me. I just put it and code it the way you did with phylum and genus and species. It's in my <laughs> brain. It's wired that way. So after college, I received an offer from the Revlon Research Center to be assistant to the medical director and the director of pharmacological research at Revlon. Their research center was in the Bronx. I was a New Jersey girl. I didn't know where the Bronx was. And um, they had more art on the walls than some museums. It was a fascinating place. It was the heyday of Mr. Revson and Miss Arden 
and all this competition going on. And I learned a tremendous amount at Revlon. And after Revlon, I got a job as director of advertising and fashion at J.P. Stevens, the oldest textile company in America. They wanted to start three brands in a hosiery business all at once. And I was there when we went from zero to 30 million in one year by selling these three brands into department stores. I visited 90 of the top 100 department stores personally and made presentations on these brands. It was like baptism by fire. My mentor was Mr. Donald Newman, who had been uh, head of sales at Scaparelli, an old fashion uh, and hosiery brand. And he was a stickler for if you have to be there for a nine o'clock meeting, get there the night before, you know, that kind of thing. I really learned from an old timer and it was fascinating. And after J.P. Stevens, Elizabeth Arden had heard about my work and I took a job there as director of marketing. And then I got five raises in five years and was director of advertising and creative services at Elizabeth Arden worldwide for 55 countries. And the reason I wow. left was they offered me the job of doing all this international additional work for a title of vice presidency, but no more money. There was a little <laughs> stop on salaries. And I thought, what's wrong with this picture? And I did go off on my own. I left Arden. It was a very courageous thing to do, but I started my own international marketing company. So you can see that in terms of my education, which was very classical and structured, and yet my work, which was as creative director, as director of advertising, I found and directed creative people. We were the first to use Patrick de Marchalier for cosmetics. And I remember oh, wow. there were some kind of pencils, face pencils, like makeup pencils. And we used a very beautiful model that we found. I forget her name right now, but she uh, she was one of the first that ever did cosmetics with Patrick de Marchalier. And things like that. We did four color promotions a year rather than two. I had the most amazing time working with photographers, with copywriters, creative art directors. And I learned how to work with these people and get the best from them. And that has always stood me well in terms of anything that I've done now in philanthropy, basic fundraising, or working with people generally. I want to find out who they are and what they know and how they could bring what they know to our situation. And then I kind of guide them into what the marketing or the specific needs are of the issue or the project that we have in front of us. So my experience at international creative marketing, my own firm, was fascinating. One of my first jobs or projects that I got was a three-year contract from a pharmaceutical company in Italy called Bracco. They were the ones that produced the fizzy vitamin C. They were very yeah, well known in course. Italy and Europe. Yeah. And they and had, Staten Island. <laughs> they had a skincare cosmetic company that they wanted to distribute in America. And I was able to find distributors for them in America. And another company that I worked with was the Terme di Saturnia, a spa in Italy, one of the oldest original spas where the source of water comes from the deepest part in the ground. And when they analyze this water, it's made of the same vitamins and chemicals and nutrients as your own skin. So Terme di Saturnia in Italy produced a skincare brand called Terme or Spa of Saturnia. Roman soldiers used to march through those waters in Tuscany on their way to conquer the world. So it was a fascinating place. And the Doral Hotels in New York came to me and had wanted me to design some skincare products for their spas. And I didn't want to do that. Instead of just doing another skincare line, I said, I just came across this. I had visited Italy and gone to some of their Cosmoprof and some of their exhibitions that they had. 
And I saw this line, Terme de Saturnia, which would be perfect for a spa. Let me go and negotiate and see if we could get some kind of relationship. And I had studied 30 hours of Italian when I had met my first clients. And that 30 hours I taped and I kept repeating and repeating those lessons. So I spoke like a beginner would, but I still was able to put sentences together. And I went to Terme de Saturnia and met with the owners and spoke a little Italian. And they were so impressed that an American made an effort to speak to them in their native language. So we did get the deal. We got the tie-in with Terme de Saturnia to create the Dural Saturnia Spa. And it was an amazing place in Miami that the Dural owned. We brought over the crystallized water of Saturnia. We brought over mud for facials and all. It was fascinating. And then I got the rights, the North American rights to distribute the Termi de Saturnia skincare in all of North America. So that was very exciting. And I also became president and co-owner of Termi de Saturnia and launched it at Saks Fifth Avenue. The year that I married my husband, it was <laughs> amazingly, amazingly challenging because here I was married to the love of my life, my second husband, and I couldn't be with him. I had to go around the country to 38 stores and do the in-store appearances, the TV and radio appearances. And I thought, something is not quite right here. My husband never said a word, but I realized that this amazing accomplishment of being co-owner of your own line was every person's dream in the skincare business or the cosmetic business. What's driving all this? Why do you want to be in spa? Why do you want to launch these? Like, what's helping you choose this direction? First of all, I think everything about me and the drive to succeed came from my parents' loss of their homeland and having to concentrate on education. They said to me, if anything happens, you can lose anything in life, but get the best education and then make something of yourself. So there was never even any question that I would be a good student and that I wanted to be successful in life by providing for myself. I had to work. I didn't want to take money from my parents. So I wanted to support myself and do it in the best way, which is why I think I had that drive and ambition. It's very good for people to have yeah. the value of earning money, making your own dollar. You know, I see now in a different economic element of my life, I see many people who are very, very successful. And of course, they want the best for their children. But often, children who don't know the value of earning their own income are a little bit lost. They may yeah. not know what makes them feel good or just the basic value of oneself by knowing that you can do something by depending on yourself. Yeah, it sounds like you got to do that um, and your mom got to see you do that. Yes, she did. She yeah. was always very proud of me. She was the most supportive mother. You're lucky if your parents are supportive like that. But if you don't have supportive parents, get supportive friends. Get somebody <laughs> in yes. your life that always says you're good enough just by yourself and what you do. But it's finding the right niche. The Hope for Depression Research Foundation mission is to fund cutting-edge scientific research into the origins, diagnoses, treatment, and prevention of depression, and its related mood and other emotional disorders, such as bipolar disorder, postpartum depression, post-traumatic stress syndrome, anxiety disorder, and suicide. In 2010, HDRF launched its Depression Task Force, an outstanding collaboration of seven leading scientists from around the world who continue to share information in real time thanks to the HDRF Data Center. HDRF was founded in April 2006 by Audrey Gruss in memory of her mother, Hope, who suffered from clinical depression. Every dollar raised goes directly to research. Being able to be successful in front of your mom must have been super rewarding considering why HDRF is created and Hope Fragrances and how I know you now. At what age did life change for you with her and how did that impact 
the trajectory of what you ended up creating. What's so interesting is that in the years that my mother had depression and struggled with it, that was in the 50s when she first had what was called a nervous breakdown. That's what everybody called what is now known as major depressive disorder, depression. We weren't told very much, my father, sisters, and I. And for years, she was misdiagnosed, given a lot of different medication. I thought they were all medications from different countries and that the pharmaceutical industry traditionally was creating new medications. So during her lifetime, I thought that she was getting the best care that she could and being medicated with the best medications. I did not know until after she passed away in 2005 that there were no new medications since Prozac was introduced Hmm. in 1985. And that's one of the reasons that I started Hope for Depression Research Foundation. Ironically, my mother's name was Hope. When she passed away, I asked her psychiatrist, I said, Why did my mother never get full remission of her feelings, of her illness? Why did she have such side effects? And then he told me to go see some other people, neuroscientists, psychopharmacologists, what the situation was. There was a crisis in depression and in the entire field. Seven of the top pharmaceutical companies stopped doing brain research in 2005, 2006, The only category of medications available were the old kind of mono and tricyclics, which had been around for 60 years, and the SSRIs, but Mm -hmm. they don't work on 50% of the people who don't respond to them. My mother only partially responded to them. So an entire new category of medications are needed, and I had no idea that I, as an average citizen, could help. But in talking to these neuroscientists, they said, absolutely, a whole new area of science is needed and a different way of working to speed up brain research and to keep scientists here. A lot of neuroscientists were being seduced into going to Europe for better salaries and better conditions and whatever. So this whole paradigm came together of the timing of not having new medications, scientists going to Europe, pharmaceutical companies not doing brain science. And I thought, well, look, I'm a businesswoman. Let me get some great doctors together and see what we could do that's different. And we did. I started Hope for Depression Research Foundation in 2006. It is now our 15th year that we are in business. We are the leading solely depression research organization in the country. We work differently because our neuroscientists from all over the world absolutely must collaborate and work together. And they share their research data, input their data in real time into the Hope Data Center, which happens to be at the University of Michigan. These doctors are rock stars. They are brilliant. They are creating a whole new area of brain science where they've identified potential new circuits in the brain that might have different causes of depression. And we are now actually in clinical trials with a potential new category that is in a different circuit than the way the SSRIs work, if you stay with me on that. Yeah, I'm here. Completely different category. We're at Mount Sinai and Columbia with proof of concept and the beginning trials of this. And if it's successful, it will be a game changer in the field by providing a new medication to those people who do not respond to what's out there. I am hoping against hope, and we have very good signs that this is a positive, positive direction. Yeah, so hope it's is the very right exciting. word. It's very exciting. You know what else I wanted to make sure that I include? I recall that my parents, from when I was a child, would send care packages to their family that was left in Europe under communist regime to help them. Whatever they had, whatever excess they had, they gave to church, they gave to their family, they helped others. 
They were very giving, good people. And when you see that in your family, you're kind of that person as well, or at least I was. And when I married my husband, he had been a philanthropist. He and his family just were natural philanthropists. And when I gave up termi dysaturnia and had to do something, I turned to philanthropy. I know one year our accountant said we supported over 200 charities that year. And I found that what I could give to these charities was my time and, of course, support and donations. But not one of these charities, they were all fabulous in medical research, in uh, the arts, in in, in, uh, culture. Not one of them really struck me as something that was mine, that really meant something to my core. Not until I saw the situation with my mother and depression did I feel that I could do something. And truly, by taking my business training and combining the assets of being to start something with my own money and be supportive of it, these things come together. I get up every morning and think I'm working on one of the most difficult subjects in the world, but I feel so positive and so excited that we are making a difference. How do you deal with anxiety? I mean, how do I deal with anxiety? How can I help? I mean, even if I'm trained to cope with my own anxiety, it certainly doesn't make me a doctor. I'm not qualified necessarily to help people with their anxiety, but we are brothers and sisters. How do we keep watch over our community? I mean, this is a dangerous time. We need to be vigilant. Vigilance can save lives. I'm thankful for the four pillars of good mental health Mrs. Gruss is about to share with us. These are signs and symptoms to look out for in others. Scientists do their brilliant, painstaking, time-consuming work. And we know that what we did by coming to this potential new category of of medication, of antidepressant, we did that in seven years. It's unheard of that a group would do it that quickly. But still, it's slow for us wanting to get information out there. So what I did was design a Hope fragrance line. I couldn't keep it down. I couldn't, I mean, I had to think what other way can we get information, education out there to our people? The fragrance business is a multi-billion dollar business. I thought if we had hope fragrances with every package that we sell and then every insert that we put in our package, this is hope fragrance. It is delicious. My mother loved fragrances. My mother would combine. She loved white fragrances. She loved Lily of the Valley, Jasmine, Gardenia, and Tuberose. And I would see her at her dressing table, take one and spray another. I never saw anybody do that, would spray two or three. And every day she'd create her own unique fragrance that defined her. I thought, how creative. And when it came to designing the fragrance, I took all four fragrances that she loved And I said, can we meld them? Can we fuse them and create something even more unique? And that's the original Hope. And then last year, we designed the Hope Sport Fragrance, which is for the active woman. When I put on my exercise clothes in the morning and I don't get out of them sometimes all day, I just spray Hope Sport on because it's very green and citrusy and natural and relaxed and sporty and a very, very exciting fragrance that we launched last September. And then the Pièce de Résistance is Hope she is. Night. So yeah. romantic, so sensual. It's got a little base, a DNA of our brand as the base, gardenia and tuberose. And then we added, here comes vanilla for comfort and relaxation, amber for a little splash of spiciness, plum a fruity, exotic, extra dimension that is unexpected, and then vetiver and patchouli and some other little secrets in there that make this a very special, romantic and relaxing fragrance. So the fragrance business, as I mentioned, is multi-billions of dollars. If we get 1% of that, it would be an amazing way to spread the message, have people read the backstory about hope, And also, 100% of our net profits go directly back 
the Hope for Depression Research Foundation. It's a win-win situation. And we are now at Bergdorf Goodman with the Hope Fragrance. We're also online at hopefragrances.com. I recently watched Ewan McGregor's Halston about the Studio 54 days and, yes. and certainly about fashion in New York City. And you learned a little bit about Calvin Klein growing up. You sort of understood how fashion and how the blue jeans had an impact. But more than anything, it made me fall in love again with our shape, the bottle, our Mark Rosen designed bottle. And I just oh. want to talk a second yeah. about that bottle. Many people who will be listening to this podcast, if you could imagine a bottle that looks like a person, strong, structured. Happy uh, to notice uh, my shoulders say, today. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Talk to me about, because you have so much exposure to information and marketing and advertising. How did you land on the shape of this bottle? Mark Rosen and I landed on it because my input to him was hope, the uplifting fragrance. If you search for a balance of body and mind, wear hope and lift your senses. And um, he came up with this idea of the uplifting, upward feeling of the bottle, which you can see how the shape mm -hmm. goes up. He extended the neck of the bottle with this wonderful uh, circular elongated neck. And it's a very classic, simple bottle. You know, we had to take that fine line between a fragrance that is a fragrance for charity, where it didn't look like we're spending all our money on this overdone bottle. Mark yeah. is a genius. And when it came time to design the packaging, I called Mark. I said, Mark, you're still the best packaging person I know. He's still designing brilliant cosmetic and other kind of packaging. And I gave him our brief and went over the background. And he came up with this bottle and we all fell in love. It's just, just beautiful. So that was Mark Rosen. As I say, it's great to have good friends and to have creative friends around you because they come up with the best. We launched our two new fragrances, The Sport and the Night, in the middle of COVID. But the brand has been built by people going in. As soon as the store opened, people went in and they've been buying online and we're advertising, we're marketing, we're promoting to give Hope a real voice in the fragrance market. It is unique. Nobody gives 100% of their net profits back yeah. to research. So it's and, really a very, very special situation. And it's not like you made the bottle and are just waiting for people to find it. I was lucky enough to get to be on set with you. I haven't been on a photo shoot that big in a long time because you know how small these screens have gotten and how tiny these cameras have gotten. Uh, I never thought that I would get to say that I, I got to work with a brand that had a two-page spread in Vogue. We have a beautiful card that says Ho, and then which fragrance you check, and you spray the card, and people can smell that. And if they go to our a website, hopefragrances.com, they can ask for a sample and we'll send a sample to them immediately. If you were going to be stuck with a scent during the day, a little shot of that green, like we talked about exactly. at the top of this interview. Exactly. It's, it really is a very inviting scent. You know, uh, Vinny, what recent research has shown us, you mentioned the word green. It's so amazing that if you can during your day just go out to a little mini, what do they call them, pocket parks or to Central Park or wherever you are. Just go out from your home or your office, go into a green environment, trees, grass, flowers. You get a surge of hope in your heart. I mean, it's just so beautiful. But it, it's research shows that even 15 minutes of being in a natural nature's green environment is great for the brain. It's great for mental health. It just clears you of stress, of negative feelings, and you just feel renewed by that. So that's a little bit of something that I learned recently um, from, I think, some research that was done in England, as a matter of fact. Well, England is so green and beautiful that people <laughs> have a big chance to go out in greenery all the time. But we have parks. We can do that. Yeah, I love that suggestion. I find that when I get 15 minutes to calm down, even if I'm, so I'm getting a little bit stressed out. Here's, I want to talk, here's some anxieties kicking in. I'm thinking about 
going outside for 15 minutes and I'm thinking about turning my phone off and I'm thinking about disconnecting. Am I spending those 15 minutes correctly? Um, what should I be thinking about? How should I be organizing my time? And one of the recent um, pieces of advice I got is just making it finite. It's 15 minutes that you're not going to do anything else other than go outside. That's the 15 minutes that nothing happens. That 15 minutes is like lunch for your brain. If you're going out and going to have a quick sandwich or a salad or something, you're also feeding your brain. You're just clearing it of that stress. You're clearing it of negative thoughts. You're really nurturing the best, most important part of your body is your brain. If we don't take care of our brain, where do we go? And that's why I think even though it's a sad way that it happened, but with this COVID epidemic, 41% of Americans have some type of depression or anxiety. We have to nurture our brain because the after effects of this pandemic are going to stay with us for a while, unfortunately. And we've got to do things that are better for our brain. You know, at Hope for Depression, we say that there are four pillars of mental health that we can do for ourselves all the time. They're very simple and basic. There's sleep. Try to get what is the optimum amount of sleep for you. Some people it's eight hours, some people it's seven hours, some people it's nine hours, whatever it is, try to do that calming, relaxing thing so you're not listening to terrible news or whatever before you go to yeah. sleep. Do all the things that you have to do to get a good night's sleep. So sleep. Number two, exercise. Absolutely vital for the brain and for the body and for de-stressing sleep, exercise, nutrition. There are foods that are definitely more positive for the brain. Avocado and greens, the greens of nature, very healthy eating. Plant-based eating is also very healthy. But even if you have red meat, just make sure you get some vegetables mm -hmm. and grains and healthy kind of things into you. So we've got sleep, exercise, nutrition, and mindfulness or meditation. So that 15 minutes outside, half an hour would even be better if you can squeeze that in. But in that moment, when those moments when you're outside, try to breathe, breathe in, breathe out in a relaxed way, soak in that nature around you, kind of clear your brain. And that's part of meditation, whatever way you meditate, whatever means mindfulness to you, I mean, you can actually take courses in it. They have it online. Just relax, slow down. They say that it works physically on your body as well as mentally for your mind. Four things. Try to remember them. It's so easy. Sleep, exercise, nutrition, and mindfulness. And if we do a little bit of that every day, three times a week, twice a week, anything is better than not. So there are things that we can find within us to do. I try. I love it. These are great insights. And not only do I hope that I have written them down in the front part of my brain permanently forever, I've already taken note of them. Sleep is so important. And you mentioned even just like disconnecting before going to bed. I remember at one of the HDRF galas, um, I think it was Chuck Scarborough who talked about how media executives are exposed to traumatic content, unedited unfortunately, and then it gets edited again, how that just has, you know, an actual impact. And I know what Just TV is. Just TV is real. Even it's scripted reality, it's still real people, real actions. And that energy before bed, making that shift has really helped me um, a lot. And a good effort. Vinny, I love your word, disconnect. you got to try to disconnect before you want to go to sleep. If you're actively watching something that's, you know, very difficult or anxiety provoking, it's not going to help you fall asleep. Also, a little hope night sprayed on your pillow is a lovely way to get these wonderful fragrances going into your olfactory system and immediately making you feel relaxed and kind of sensual. Mm -hmm. I love that you talk about disconnecting and then you ended this with meditation, which to me is reconnecting. You're saying, be mindful of how you reconnect. So be mindful when we plug it in and let the energy sort of, you know, roll the way that, you know, is, is best intended for you. Yeah. 
Your mental health is extremely important. Make sure you're okay before you check on others because you matter. Make sure you're always wary of how you feel. Share those red flags with us. Let us know what to look for when you or someone you know is suffering in silence. And check in with everyone. Don't forget about those who are isolated during and post the pandemic. We're all suffering and we're all dealing with this emotionally in our own unique ways. During these times, and we still have the ending of COVID and the the carryover of the stresses that we've gone through, it is very important to notice in your friends and family, to notice that there are changes in their behavior, in their mood, if in any of those four pillars of good mental health, if there are changes, if you see somebody sleeping too much or too little, eating too much or too little, if they are constantly being negative or blaming themselves for things that they have nothing to do with, if they are negative, if they don't enjoy the things that they've enjoyed in the past, and those are just the first four or five symptoms of depression. But if you notice a change in behavior or mood in those close to you, kind of gently ask them if they feel well and if there's anything you can do to help. Because in those closest around us, our business associates, our family associates, those that we love, they're going through, all of us are going through this. And we have to be aware of each other and try to help each other. And I do have the 10 signs of depression that I can send you that yeah, people please. want to write in for. We'd be glad to send them. And those 10 signs of depression, yeah. but some of them are unexpected, uh, especially in children. Children manifest them a depression a little bit differently than adults do. Uh, yeah. and so do this, geriatric people. So I'm hearing, I, it's, I was gonna say, I'm hearing from you is that I don't have to know you have a mental health issue to be able to ask you it. If I think you have mental, if you might have mental health issues, then it's okay. I can see a lot of people saying, well, what if I don't, what if I'm wrong? We're not saying reach out to someone and say, Hey, I think you have mental health issues. You're not the doctors. Like that's not what we're saying. Right. If you notice changes in behavior, mm -hmm. say to that person, how are you? I know you, I'm a friend. And I just noticed something a little bit different, a little bit off. And are you feeling okay? If you're not feeling okay, how can I help you? Can I go to your doctor with you? That's one thing you can always offer. People, if they just have an out, if they see that they have someone to open up to, men especially don't want to talk to anybody, not even their Mm -hmm. wives or loved ones, just offer to talk to them. Can I find a doctor for you? Can I take you to your internist with you? Can I just help in some way? That really is a very good opening to try to get help to those who feel they've got to keep it all within and go through depression or anxiety by themselves. So many people don't get the help that they need, and they can be helped. There is cognitive behavioral therapy or talk therapy. There are antidepressants that can help. Now, granted, not everyone responds to those, but you absolutely have to try to see if what is out there works for you because so many people can be helped. Yeah, it's so true. And um, it's just better to be safe than sorry because sorry could last a very long time if you don't act now. So act now because now matters, especially as we're going back to this new normal or whatever we're going to call this post-pandemic. Be mindful of it. There's a reason why you're saying start the day in meditation and and, and, and rightfully. And um, it's a great point. And I might even um, put this in my routine of just so I can ask more often. So this is a great lesson for me to bring into life, especially as we're moving out of mental health month of May and into the summer too. And as people are getting back to whatever this new normal is to uh, right. just check in with more people. And thank you so much for making time to talk with me today. And it was wonderful to be with you. It's great. Really to be my with pleasure. You. And I hope to see you soon. And thank you um, for uh, everything. Have a great day. You've been listening to I Have a Podcast with Vinny Potestivo. Because of the nature of this episode, I want to offer up the phone number for the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, which is 1-800-273-8255. That's 800-273-TALK. 
I really appreciate you listening to this episode. I promised it would be an extremely special one. If there are any information you'd like to see, please check out our podcast show notes anywhere where you're checking out this podcast. Leave us a review, send us a message, connect with us on ihaveapodcast.com. Thanks a lot for listening, and we'll see you next week. 